Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Shaw Taylor, and I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing at Spot, and I am your host. Today's webinar is entitled, Mobilizing Witnesses to Tackle Workplace Harassment and Discrimination. We're excited to have both Jessica Collier, CEO, and Julia Shaw, co-founder and head of research at Spot. She's also a renowned TED Talk speaker. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Ring Central control panel. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation. All right, without further ado, we'll jump right into the agenda. So today's session is gonna cover five key areas. First, Julia will set the stage by sharing sharing information around the definitions of harassment and discrimination. Immediately after that, Jessica will share findings as to why underreporting in the workplace is so prevalent today. Third, we'll dive deeper and discuss why anonymous reporting should be the cornerstone to any organization's reporting infrastructure. Fourth, Julia will come back and share findings from our witness research efforts, which really is the crux of today's, of today's webinar. Lastly, we'll tease out key insights around the witness reporting research followed by an interactive Q&A session. So once again, keep in mind that we've got a Q&A chat box at the bottom of your session. Feel free to open them up, ask questions, and we'll get to them at the close of the, of the, uh, of the day. Before we go on, I'd love to issue the first polling question of the day. First polling question reads, what is your role in your organization? We'll wait just a moment while we collect the results. We'll be right back. Fantastic. Hey, thanks for uh, taking part in the poll. It looks like about two thirds of the audience is HR specific. About 10% have a people title. About 10% also have a diversity, inclusion, or equity title. And about 5% are compliance with the balance, the other three. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, that's really useful information for everybody. We will indeed leverage that information and, um, and use that in a go forward. Fantastic. Good. With that, I am going to introduce Julia Shaw and she'll take the mic from here. Julia, you're on. Thanks, Shaw. Um, great, so I thought we'd start with some definitions. Uh, so a quick recap, I'm sure that because all of you are in HR, um, you've heard these definitions before, and yet I think it's always good to go over them again to make sure we're all on the same page. So what actually are harassment and discrimination? Next slide. First, let's define harassment. Slide. Here's a quick test. So. Is this harassment? You're experiencing clinical depression and your manager makes comments suggesting that depression isn't a real thing. You're just being lazy and need to cheer up. So I'm gonna give you a few seconds to think about whether you think this constitutes harassment. Okay, as you may have guessed, uh, yes, on the next slide, uh, this is likely to be harassment. Uh, harassment occurs when someone in your workplace subjects you to unwelcome conduct like offensive jokes, insults, images, threats, physical assaults that is based on your protected class or characteristic like your race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or age. And this conduct either becomes a condition of continued employment or it is severe or pervasive enough to create a working environment that a reasonable person would consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive, or it results in an adverse employment decision like being fired, demoted, given fewer shifts, or given a smaller bonus. Now that's quite a complex definition, but also in terms of who can be the harasser, uh, some clarification I think is needed, which is that the person harassing you can be your supervisor, it can be another supervisor, a colleague, your employer's agent, or a non-employee such as a client or customer. 
And note that generally annoyances and isolated incidents, unless they're extremely serious, will not amount to unlawful harassment. Okay, next slide. Now quickly, what is discrimination? On the next slide, you get another quick test. So is this discrimination? You're not invited to a work lunch because you're gay and the colleague organizing the lunch disapproves of your lifestyle. Again, I'll give you a few seconds to think about this one. On the next slide, as you may have guessed, also again, yes. This is likely to fall into one of the two main types of discrimination, disparate treatment. Disparate treatment means that your employer treats you differently than somebody else because you are a member of a protected class, again, like your race, color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, or age. In this kind of unfair treatment, discrimination simply has to be what's called a motivating factor in the treatment. On the next slide, one more case for you. Is this discrimination? Your employer has a policy that applies to everyone and it stipulates that either everyone has to be six feet tall or everyone has to speak English. What do you think? Does this count as discrimination? Okay. Again, you may have guessed, yes. This is also a type of discrimination. Um, disparate impact can happen when your employer uses a neutral employment policy or practice, so one which applies to everyone, but it has a disproportionately adverse impact on members of a protected class. So in this particular example, if it's unnecessary, this particular example, women or people uh, of foreign origin might be particularly vulnerable, vulnerable to being disproportionately treated. Um, the policy or practice also needs to be not job related or necessary for the operation of the organization. Now there's lots of situations where you don't actually need to be able to speak English in order to do your job well, and you don't need to be very tall. And so it's making sure that policies are fair, even if it seems like they aren't directly discriminating because they aren't, they're disparately discriminating. Um, when are employers liable? This is a question we get asked a lot, or, and I'm sure lawyers get asked a lot, even though, again, just to, to make sure I'm a scientist, not a lawyer, but we do deal a lot with issues of harassment and discrimination, which is why we're comfortable talking about at least the definitions. Um, when are employers liable? Generally, employers are liable if they knew or should have known about the harassment and failed to take prompt and appropriate corrective action. Now, does that all make sense? If you're still a bit confused about the definitions, that's normal. Whether any particular instance counts as harassment or discrimination can be tricky to know. And this is made even more difficult because laws, of course, vary across states and countries. We actually have a legal handbook that you can access at talktospot.com slash handbook if you want to learn more about these concepts, want to see more examples, want to learn more about the definitions. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you're also welcome, of course, to ask questions. So that's it from me for now. Over to Shaw for a quick poll. Great. Hey, thanks, Julia. Hey, before moving on to the next section, we'd love to share what your peers are doing in the audience to tackle workplace harassment and discrimination in our second poll. So let me go ahead and launch that poll right now. And you'll see that the question reads, how does your organization currently ask employees to report harassment and discrimination? Please take a moment and answer all that apply. We'll wait just a few seconds while we tally some of the results. Again, feel free to tag all that apply. Great. Fantastic. It looks like 83% of you, not a big surprise there, suggest that employees talk to HR. 72% um, suggest that you talk to your manager. Um, about 10% use a company provided web form. About 28% use a company provided hotline. And 17% of you use other means to manage reporting. Very nice, thanks so much for that. Let me share the results and you can take a quick look. And we will close. Thanks so much. Next, I'd like to introduce again, Jessica. Jessica Collier is the CEO of SPOT, 
and she's going to talk a little bit about underreporting. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here today. So we're going to talk a little bit about underreporting. Um, we're going to start with what we know from research about who experiences harassment and discrimination at work and at what rates. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our research team reviewed existing academic and government governmental research on this topic from the last 10 years or so, and the overwhelming theme of everything that is available on the research side is that the workplace has a systemic underreporting problem. Uh, as you can see on the next slide, studies from the last 10 years indicate that about 60% of women have experienced sexual harassment at some point in their careers, and that number goes up to 90% for women in the service industry. Uh, one study indicated that 65% of university students who are people of color experienced racial discrimination in just a single 12-month period, and 97% of LGBTQ plus individuals have reported experiencing various forms of harassment at work. So the problem is really widespread and it affects a whole bunch of different people in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and yet, no, that's great. And yet, go, yeah, exactly, you were right with me. And yet, according to a 2016 report from the EEOC, at least 70% of harassment and discrimination goes unreported. This number fluctuates a little bit as these annual reports are issued, but 70% is actually on the low end, meaning that you are only likely to ever hear about a maximum of 30% of the incidents that are happening. And I think undoubtedly one of the reasons that we're all here talking about workplace harassment and discrimination is that while underreporting continues to be a huge problem, there have been big, splashy, really public developments that put this issue in the spotlight. Uh, on the next slide, we can, I think we all know that between uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, the Me Too movement fundamentally changed the nature of the conversation. The Me Too hashtag, which was introduced for women to share stories of their experiences on social media, went viral. Or it was used 19 million times just in that 12 month period. The EEOC filed 50% more harassment lawsuits in 2017 than in the previous year. And, you know, topping it all off were the US Supreme Court hearings um, for the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh, which only added fuel to the debate fire on how we handle cases of alleged sexual misconduct. So the Me Too movement means that people are generally more aware of the issue of harassment and that larger cultural awareness is leading to changes um, at the company level and it's also leading to sweeping legal action. At least two states have already passed new laws around workplace harassment and we should expect to see more. So again, I want to stipulate that we are not employment attorneys, um, but we've done a lot of research into what's happening in this space. And I think uh, the legislation that's coming down the pipeline is indicative of where we're all moving as a society. Um, in April, New York State's new laws, which focus primarily on sexual harassment, went into effect. This legislation was, um, was frankly historic. It requires companies of 15 or more people to provide annual anti-harassment training and to have a sexual harassment prevention policy, including a complaint form for reporting. That might not sound like much, but as a legal requirement, it's a big development. Um, California is on the heels of New York with new legislation that goes into effect in January that cover, covers similar issues. Uh, California will require harassment training for companies of five employees or more, and that includes part-time workers and contractors. So these new laws are attempting to put companies on notice that employers need to help their teams understand proper behavior and provide clear and actionable channels for reporting improper behavior when it inevitably does happen at some point. And that brings us to an important piece of the underreporting puzzle, which is anonymity. So we're going to talk a little bit about how anonymous reporting um, is helpful for challenging or for tackling the, the big, big problem of underreporting in the workplace. Even when people do find the courage to speak up, which as we know from the data that we just covered is pretty rare, HR is not always great at listening. And that is not because HR isn't well-intentioned or well-trained, it's because as humans, we're all subject to a couple of behaviors 
that make us not that great at interviewing people about emotional events. Right? We're busy and we make people feel rushed, right? We might have another meeting to go to. We don't necessarily have time to sit through a long a recounting of an emotional event. Um, we get bored, we stop paying attention. We lead the conversation in a way that benefits us or the company. Um, we introduce bias even when we don't mean to, which is why it's frequently referred to as unconscious bias. Um, we also interrupt all the time. So statistically speaking, if I were to ask you, the participants of this webinar, to describe an emotional event to me, I would then proceed to interrupt you every three seconds, even if like most HR professionals, I'm trained not to do that. And one of the rarely discussed issues with the fact that talking to humans can prevent people from reporting incidents is that harassment and discrimination tends to affect people in a variety of ways and not all of those consequences are immediate or obvious. So when someone documents an incident with SPOT, we ask them how the incident affected their well-being. And based on hundreds of reports submitted to Julia's team for research purposes, we have quite a bit of analysis on the consequences that victims often face. People report feeling disappointed or humiliated, suffering from depression, anxiety. Um, many people report having physical symptoms such as blood pressure issues, which is also something that has cropped up in other research. Uh, and they certainly report losing faith in their organization and feeling isolated or powerless. So it's easy to see how we go from these uh, consequences on people's well-being to an organizational situation where you have just a real dip in morale. A small number of people have also reported having suicidal thoughts. Luckily, <laughs> there's a, this is all not great news so far, I know, um, but luckily there's a strong first step that we can take towards solving what is essentially a people problem. Um, we can remove humans from the part of the equation where we tend to be the biggest liability. And we know what the barriers to reporting are, right? People fear retaliation uh, because according to a 2003 study that happens in about 75% of cases, people fear not being believed if they report. People are often required to report incidents to their managers. And in 79% of cases, managers are the ones doing the harassing, right? This is a very common organizational structure, right? If you have a problem, you talk to your manager. I think the poll question from just now showed that many of your organizations are also structured that way. Um, and then another barrier that, that seems really intuitive, but I think it's easy to forget about is that people are sometimes simply embarrassed to talk to somebody at work about an emotional event, right? You might be very likely to talk to a family member or a friend and much less likely to talk to someone at work who is actually in a position to do something about it. So based on what we know about these barriers to reporting, part of the solution is to allow people to report, one, anonymously, and two, not to a human. But then again, most of what we know, at least until recently, about underreporting and the barriers to reporting centers on victims. Um, our research team, however, in kind of combing through the research or the reports that have been contributed to us for research, realize that many incidents at work are witnessed. In fact, the majority of incidents at work have a witness. And they recently finished a substantial survey on the witness experience. Um, Julia is going to run through a lot of our initial findings from that survey. Uh, before I hand it over to her, though, I think we're going to ask another polling question. You're absolutely right. We are going to ask another polling question. Um, the question reads, does your organization actively support witness reporting? I'm going to launch the poll right now. And hopefully, you've got the opportunity to kind of address and answer the question. Please just answer one of the below. Again, yes, my organization does support witness reporting. We kind of support witness reporting. I'm not really sure. No, we don't really, and no. Let's see what we've got. It looks like we've got the majority of people that have responded. It looks like 52% of you, wow, do, do actually support witness reporting within your organization. Um, about 30% aren't really sure, and the hard no's only constitute around 11%. That's fantastic, fantastic. Um, that's great fodder and a great setup.
up for Julia, who's going to come back and share some of the insights that we've got from the witness recording research study that the team just concluded. Julia. Thanks, Shaw. This is the part of the webinar that I'm most excited about because it refers to our most recent research. And as a scientist, I'm always most excited about what the SPOT science team is doing um, because I think it's really important that we contribute to the larger body of knowledge and that we build tools that actually make workplaces safer and help you tackle as HR professionals um, workplace harassment and discrimination as quickly and effectively as possible. Um, so earlier this year, in terms of context, uh, I led a large research study on the experience of witnessing workplace harassment and discrimination, and I'm going to talk about some of the results of this research. The findings were released just a couple of weeks ago, and the report is called Witnessing Workplace Harassment and Discrimination overcoming the social contagion of toxic work culture. And I'm so happy that it's already getting major, major traction, including a long interview in Forbes um, and, a, and a few, <coughs> sorry, uh, a few interviews in HR outlets as well. Um, so the research involved a collaboration actually between SPOT um, and researchers from three universities, including myself at University College London, Dr. Camilla Elphick at the Open University, and Dr. Rashid Minas at the University of West London. We also partnered with various nonprofits and NGOs who provide support for individuals with protected characteristics. So this was a real team effort, and there were four phases of the study, so it was a really big study done over... Um, a couple of months where we really made sure that we collected the most reliable data possible from the biggest pool possible so that we really helped to understand the witness experience. Our final data set included 1,096 participants, which as far as I know is the biggest study of this kind to date, of which 889 witnesses completed the entire survey, which is actually a really good rate. Um, and the participants were predominantly from the US, but also some are from the UK and Australia. On the next slide, um, I think the main thing that is important to me is basically realizing that witnesses represent a largely untapped resource in the fight against harassment and discrimination in the workplace. And then, so I think this is our main finding, and I think that you'll see why we came to this conclusion. Um, now, it may seem a little bit obvious as well, but I think that the experience of witnesses and the nuances of this are really quite useful for your everyday experiences, especially as HR professionals. Um, so research on witnesses is important for two main reasons, as far as I'm concerned. First, it's not just targets of harassment and discrimination who can suffer negative consequences. Of course, witnesses too can be affected negatively by seeing or knowing about such behavior in their workplaces. Now, this can create a toxic culture for everyone who works in the organization if it's not tackled appropriately. Second, witnesses have the potential to be helpful allies and to alleviate some of the burden of reporting from people who experience harassment and discrimination directly. So we conducted the study because understanding the witness experience can help organizations and people like yourselves, we think, create more effective processes to tackle this issue at work, to improve communication between employees and human resources, and to build healthier workplaces. On the next slide, you'll see another thing that inspired our research, which was actually previous research. So when we analyze hundreds of reports of harassment and discrimination that Jessica already alluded to, which were sent to us via talktospot.com for research purposes, so real cases using our tool for reporting where individuals sent the reports directly to us to help us understand these issues better and how people talk about it, we were shocked to find that 60% of incidents involved at least one witness. Now, since then, there's been more research that's come out around this, which has further substantiated this figure. But at the time, it really caught us off guard because two years ago, we were still mostly under the impression as a research team that harassment and discrimination happened behind closed doors. And we found that that just wasn't the case. So what we really wanted to know is that, you know, you know what does this mean and what is a witness experience actually like? And so we went on to explore that. So what did we learn about witnesses from our research? Um, the first finding on the next slide is that witnesses tell other people about what happened. They just don't tell human resources most of the time. 
Now, most of the incidents in our report were recent, and I think this matters because I think there's there's a valid critique around a lot of research that, of course, uh, academic research is slow, scientific studies take a long time to process, and it seems like the Zeitgeist is ripe, and, and we're changing how we think and talk about these issues at work with Time's Up and Me Too and all these other movements, which have really brought it to the forefront of our attention. And so I think it is important to study as recent as possible how people think and deal with this issue. Now, we asked our participants when they witnessed the harassment or discrimination, and 79% witnessed the incident within the past five years, and this includes 42% who reported witnessing it within the past year. So a lot of these incidents are recent and happened, if you will, despite these big movements. So these issues unfortunately persist. It further highlights that we continue to need to do work on this topic, um, and I think it makes the results that we found actually more interesting because they're more, well, related to now. So what were our results? Who do people tell? On the next slide. Most people who witnessed workplace and harassment, uh, workplace harassment or discrimination were affected enough about the incident to tell someone else about it. In particular, most witnesses, so 67%, told someone outside of work about the incident, particularly family and friends. Now, we had one person who said that they talked to uh, an outside organization. Basically, nobody really talked to NGOs, which we thought was interesting, uh, despite some of these participants coming via NGOs. Um, so it really was family and friends. So the people you're close to, you go home, understandably, you vent about what you saw at work. And so that's the, the main point of contact. But it suggests that there is emotional baggage that you're taking with you from work to home and you want to get it off your chest. Now on the next slide, you'll see that participants didn't just want to get it off their chest to friends and family though, almost half told colleagues, so they told other people at work about the incident. Now, of these, on the next slide, you'll see that 54% told someone on their team. Now, again, to me, this intuitively makes sense that you would want someone on your team to, to share this with because they understand the people you're talking about, they know the issues, they know the context, the nuances. But on the other hand, it does also surprise me because it seems like there might be social repercussions and worries about sharing with teammates. So I think this, it makes sense that a lot of people don't share with colleagues on their team and share with people outside, but, but some of course also do share with people on their team. Again, I think here people were clearly upset enough about witnessing the incident that they wanted to speak with others about it. So there's one type of person, of course, where we report to them if it feels a lot more serious and who generally really wants to know that this is happening. But on the next slide, you'll see that when we asked witnesses, did you make a formal report to the HR department? Um, almost everybody said no. So only 23% said that they told HR. So less than a quarter of our participants said that they made a report of any kind to their human resources department. Um, these figures are comparable to data on victim reporting, which suggests, as Jessica mentioned earlier, that um, about only about 30% uh, or, or fewer, depending on the type of harassment and discrimination and de depending on the type of reporting, uh, tell someone who can take action. Um, but it, it seems that there's similar figures going on here. So attrition is high in terms of who we report to and the seriousness of these reports, uh, regardless of whether you're a, a victim or target of harassment and discrimination or a witness. Um, research by organizations like the EEOC consistently shows these 30% figures. Um, and of course, some are even lower. So if you identify openly as LGBTQI, for example, um, if you experience harassment, the reporting rates are closer to 5%. So they're really quite abysmal. So of course, again, there's lots of levels of this that will affect how likely an individual is to report as a witness or victim. On the next slide, as a psychological scientist, this made me think about what's happening here. And I think for me, it seems that despite clearly feeling that the incident is worth telling others about, most don't tell someone who can take action to deal with or prevent this kind of behavior. Now, again, as a psychologist, to me this suggests that there's likely to be what I would refer to as a social contagion effect when individuals witness harassment and discrimination at work. So people who witness an incident 
tell others, who may then tell others, who tell others. So dissatisfaction can seep from one colleague to another to another. It can seep even potentially to potential recruits. So someone might start telling about what they experienced at work without ever having told HR uh, to people who might want to join the organization. And so it's contaminating even outside of the organization um, the, the, the workplace culture that might ensue. So harassment and discrimination don't just affect those targeted by such behavior, but can infect the whole company culture and continues to spread unless something is done to right the situation. So as far as I'm concerned, this is the worst case scenario because it can lead to an overall toxic perception of the workplace without HR even knowing that it's happening. On to finding two on the next slide. We also found that witnesses are worried about the consequences of reporting and kind of like reporting rates, so percentages, we also found that the reasons given by witnesses are actually mirrored. Um, they, they mirror those that are given by those who are directly harassed or discriminated against. So witnesses and victims, the reasons for reporting or not reporting uh, mirror each other. So let's talk about some of these barriers to witness reporting that we found. On the next slide, you'll see the top five reasons. So we asked about many, many reasons. Um, and actually one or two people said that they didn't report because they thought it was funny, which of course, I mean, there's, there's of course people in every organization that maybe are just never going to report. But overall, um, the reasons that we found were much more systemic. Um, the main reason we found was being worried about the consequences. So 34% of individuals said that they were worried about possible retaliation for themselves. Um, and again, this is also the number one reason given by victims for not reporting. Uh, second, not wanting to interfere at 29%. Now, this worry is probably more altruistic, but can result in inaction, which of course is also not helpful to victims. Third, we found that witnesses said they didn't report because they didn't know that witnesses could report at 22%. So this shows potentially a lack of communication within the organization about reporting options. Uh, fourth, we found not wanting to be a snitch at 18%. So still a lot of people saying that they are worried about considered being snitches and worried about the broader social consequences of reporting. Again, uh, these sort of social consequences piece I think is really important. Um, and then finally, not knowing how to report at 16%. Again, I think this is possibly due to a lack of communication or if your organization doesn't actually allow for witness reporting, then maybe that's just an actually not a possibility. Um, now the reason these add up to more than 100% is that participants could choose more than one option. And so uh, the other thing here that I that this suggested to us is that many people pick more than one option and so there are multiple reasons that can overlap for why people don't speak up. Okay, on the next slide, you'll see that another thing that we found that mirrors the barriers to reporting faced by direct targets of harassment and discrimination was that 14% of our witnesses stated that they were worried that their statements would not be believed. Now, this maps unfortunately onto a lot of things that are happening um, much more broadly and socially, I think, around credibility and fear of being believed about reporting these kinds of incidents. Um, it also maybe is related to people not maybe being informed or educated on how to collect and keep high quality contemporaneous evidence that can really make their case stronger if it ever comes to uh, an HR or other investigation. Um, but I think the biggest thing here is that it's a potential lack of trust in the system, which I think is really troubling. And so trying to remove that barrier and trying to make people feel like they will be taken seriously when they come forward as witnesses, I think is really important. On the next slide, um, breaking this down, we also found that when you look at witnessing something firsthand versus hearing about something, so there was a big difference as well. So individuals who heard about the situation rather than witnessing it firsthand were significantly less likely to be worried about the consequences of reporting. So 21% of those who heard about the incident said that they're worried about the consequences. Well, in the next slide, you'll see that 50% of people who were there, so of eyewitnesses, 
didn't want to report because they were worried about the consequences. Now, to me, this suggests that the level of involvement in the situation and perhaps the according perceptions of responsibility and blame may be related to how likely a witness is to report the event. So, for example, if witnesses feel like they should have intervened at the time because they were physically present, they may feel like they carry some of the blame for what happened, or they may be less likely to report for fear of negative consequence to themselves um, because of other factors. So it seems that the level of involvement plays a role here. And so again, not all witnesses are created equal because not all situations are created equal and barriers will apply differently. Finally, um, we, we did a qualitative analysis so people could provide much more free form responses as well to why they did or didn't report to HR and what their experience was like as a witness. So what I'm sharing with you here is actually just the tip of the iceberg. We have so much, we have a treasure trove of data. And frankly, we haven't even analyzed all of it yet because there's so much of it that we're parsing it into chunks because we really want to make sure we do a thorough job. But from our initial qualitative analysis, we found that 24% of those who didn't report said that they felt regret. And within those accounts, we found that some people described in detail how they'd felt regret sometimes for decades. So for the older cases, for decades that they, they should have spoken up, they should have said something, they should have been an ally, but they didn't know how or they didn't do it at the time. And on the other hand, we found that people who did report had much more positive outcomes. Again, this isn't surprising, but I think it's just another testament that the psychological consequences of dealing with these issues effectively far outlast the situation itself. So uh, on the other hand, many of those who did speak up used terms like, I felt like a hero. And this sort of went to further substantiate their own self image of being good people, of being helpful, and a feeling like they're supported and supporting a healthy workplace culture. Now, oh, the qualitative, there's so much I'd want to talk about with the qualitative analysis, uh, but we'll leave that for another time. Um, on the next slide, finding number three that I'm going to speak with you now. Um, when asked about the reasons for not reporting to HR, many witnesses also cited issues with the process itself. Now, here again, maybe we sometimes underestimate people who directly experience these situations or witnesses, but often they actually know what they want. And so if you ask people directly, what would you like to have in place in order to help you come forward? Most people are readily available to give critical feedback and to give direct recommendations. And so we found on the next slide that there were so many reasons that they, or many things that they wanted improved, but the main five, and you can see if, if you're interested in all the rest of these nuances, if you're interested in the rest of the data, um, the report that we published has all of this, these data more in depth. Um, and you can see some of the other factors as well. Um, but the top five are that witnesses reported that they wanted organizations, so going from the bottom to the top, from number five to number one, um, that they wanted organizations to make it easier to find out how to report. Um, they wanted employers to encourage witness reporting, number four. Uh, number three, they wanted an automated reporting system. And number two, they wanted to be given choices about where to report. Now, number one that we found across the board was that witnesses said that the single best way that employers can improve witness reporting is by providing a system that allows for witness anonymity. Now, this is in line with everything that we found so far. This is in line with recommendations that are made by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. This is, but this is in line with data we're seeing everywhere that anonymity needs to be baked into these systems. Otherwise, most people are just never going to speak up. Now, I think for me, these data, looking at them together and looking at these choices that witnesses have made, um, some of them are particularly relevant within the larger context. So based on what we know from various strands of research, including our own, most harassment and discrimination happens at the hand of a manager. Now, when you guys filled out the poll earlier, I noticed that quite a lot of you suggested that people could report harassment and discrimination directly to a manager. 
Now, this is quite common, and I think it's fine as an option, but occasionally we find systems where people are expected to, as a first point of contact, report to their manager. But if those are also the most likely to be the harassers, this is, of course, a major sticking point. And so we need to have a way to get around managers to get directly to HR where help can be provided. Um, of course, the other problem is that if you can't be anonymous and your manager is the harasser, which is most often, as far as we can tell the case, um, you don't want to be penalized for reporting. You don't want to get worse shifts. You don't want to be ostracized. And so anonymity is a really key ingredient. So options are important. Anonymity is important. And making it really easy and clear where people need to go are all really, really important. So on the next slide, Again, just to summarize, just to double down, the single best way that witnesses say employers can improve their witness reporting is by providing a system that allows witness anonymity. In line with this, over 80% of witnesses in our study said that allowing online reporting through an automated system was important. And finally, just to finish up the section, our research provides evidence that um, employees continue to witness har harassment and discrimination at work that they face many barriers to reporting and they want better ways to report it to their employers. We also found that compared to whistleblowing hotlines, um, those benefits were often not seen. And so anonymity makes sense in certain contexts and is more reliable or seen as more reliable basically when humans are no longer part of it because anonymity, it doesn't, things don't feel anonymous as soon as you're talking to a human being as much. So that's it for me. Back to Jessica. Fantastic. Hey, thanks, Julia. Hey, thanks for introducing your, your research and reviewing some of your findings with the audience. Um, there's a lot of data that we just covered, so I want to make sure that if you do have questions, you feel comfortable asking them. Um, we're going to take a few questions at the close of the day. So again, feel free to go to your Q&A chat box and just ask the questions and we'll queue them up and get them prepped for the, for the panelists as we, um, as we close out the day. Before we do, however, um, I want to bring Jessica back and she'll briefly share how SPOT can address some of the issues that have been discussed in, during the course of the presentation today. So I will turn it over to Jessica. Great, thank you. Um, so let's run through what we've learned in the last 45 minutes or so and maybe start talking a little bit about um, what we can actually do about it. So one of the takeaways uh, for our team, uh, for in particular, as a result of the research that Julia's team is kind of wrapping up, is that it turns out that everyone is talking about harassment and discrimination, just not to HR. And I think what this new research tells us is that HR is at actually greater risk of incubating toxic work culture without even knowing that it's happening, right? So without any intention of doing so, since harassment and discrimination is being both witnessed and talked about by more people than we previously thought. Our running hypothesis with SPOT is that AI is better than humans at helping people document emotional events thoroughly, accurately, and without bias. Um, an anonymous reporting tool can use AI to potentially get better outcomes than HR can get on their own. So the idea is that you, HR, end up with better, more thorough documentation that's acquired more efficiently and is less likely to contain bias. Um, so far that hypothesis seems to be right. Um, Julia's team has conducted studies uh, comparing an AI bot to an online form or to uh, talking to a human directly. And these studies seem to indicate that um, uh, an AI bot, which is what Spot uses to help employees create reports, gets more details, up to 40% more details, about what happened. The details are also higher quality and tend to be more specific. The other piece of this is that in these studies, people indicate that they prefer talking to a bot over talking directly to a human or using an online form. Anonymous reporting minus the humans uh, can lead to a more robust feedback culture where reporting is smaller and earlier rather than late and catastrophic, which is what we are trying to encourage with SPOT. And both the people who experience harassment and discrimination and the people who witness it seem to be telling us the same thing, which is, please let us stay anonymous. Um, so 
with a bot, people tend not to feel judged or embarrassed um, because they're not actually talking to a human who's going to respond in an emotional way or, uh, you know, kind of play on their emotions. Um, properly designed bots are less likely to introduce bias into the conversation. So no one sees what an employee talks to Spot about unless they decide to submit a report. The reporting side of Spot is essentially an AI bot for employees to report harassment and discrimination safely and anonymously. And when someone does submit a report, we've built a way for HR to ask follow-up questions via the bot without compromising employee anonymity. So this two-way communication allows for safe follow-up and ultimately leads to more engagement with HR from people who submit reports. Um, one of our customers is DeVita, which is a large medical clinic chain. Their chief people officer uh, recently told Fortune that they've seen the number of cases with which employees re-engage rise 60% since integrating spot versus their hotline. And according, according to him, that increase in follow-up leads to more employees feeling heard and feeling like their concerns were addressed, which is exactly, I think, what everyone on both sides wants. So with Spot's AI bot, employees can take as long as they need to create a report. And this is what, when an, when an employee initiates a session, this is similar to what they see. Um, employees have the option to use Spot in private, on their phone, outside of business hours, and we use natural language processing to ask questions on details that the person tells us about the incident. So the bot probes them as they're talking to it to recall as many details as possible. The benefit, I think, for HR here is that you get rich, richer, more fully detailed reports straight out of the gate. So before anyone on your team has spent any time on a case. And with anonymous follow-up, you're also more more likely to get the information that you need to resolve cases without anyone being at risk of retaliation. So a webinar is not the place to do a demo. What we really wanted to do here was to run you through the research that we have on who experiences harassment and discrimination, um, why anonymous reporting is so important, and then our very recent newly released research on witness reporting. But if you are interested in seeing how the product works, we will follow up with some links and you can always connect with us directly at uh, talktospot.com. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. And I will hand it back to Sean now. Fantastic. Hey, thanks, Jessica. Hey, we've got a little bit of time for questions right now. Um, it looks like we have a couple that came through. Um, before I ask the first question or answer the first question, um, I do wanna remind everybody that if you'd like to see Spot in action, I love this slide, but if you want to see it in more depth, we can actually take you through it. Simply send us a, a note in the chat feature or the Q&A, and we'll reach out to you and get in touch and see if we can kind of get that on your schedules. Hey, we have, do have a question that just came in. Um, the question reads, anonymous reporting seems to add to my organization's risk, and it takes more time to investigate and resolve. I understand the benefit to our employees, but how can we take this on knowing the concerns? I'll actually pass that over to Jessica. Sure, thank you. Um, so as you can imagine, this is a question that we hear variations on a lot of the time. Um, one of the th things that our customers have told us so far, and I think I should be clear that we've been selling this product since uh, October. So of our implemented customers, one of the things that we hear is that Spot saves them time on, on intake. Right, so it saves them the time of trying to figure out how to interview the person about what happened, um, to chase down details as new things come to light. You can do all of that in the bot, right? So the documentation piece of the puzzle and the follow-up investigatory piece of the puzzle are things that we think Spot, according to our customers, does a lot more efficiently as part of the HR workflow. Julia, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think that answers it. Great. Hey, we do have one more question that just popped in. Um, how does Spot protect employee? Can't make that up. How, do, how does Spot uh, protect employee um, um, permissions and such? Employee protections. Um, I think they. So it sounds like this question might be asking how Spot protects. Employee anonymity? Yeah, that sounds like it. How do we? 
Can um, we keep that same? So HR does have uh, contact with the employee via the bot, which acts as a neutral sort of third party mediator between HR and the employee who submitted the report. So HR can ask follow up questions and get responses to those questions from the employee, but it's the bot who is delivering the questions to the employee and then taking the responses and bringing them back to HR. So I think that's, I think that's what's being asked is um, how, how do we do actual, how does HR do follow up if the employee is totally anonymous? And that's the answer is that HR might not have the direct details or contact information of the person who submitted the report, but SPOT does. Perfect. Okay, we do have one more and I'm gonna ask Julia to address this one. Hey, if the report is made by the victim and it's about a manager or someone in a supervisory role, is there a way for the report conversation to be documented or have a copy sent to the individual just in case there's retaliation? That's a great question. Um, so, uh, so, so, is, if it's, so it's made by the victim about a manager or someone in a supervisory role. Um, Yes, so when individuals use, when employees use Spot, what they do is they actually first create a version of the documentation that they keep for themselves. Now, there's a couple of reasons we do this. The first reason is to make sure that employees can read through their own accounts and have control over the information they're sharing so that things don't just sort of disappear out of their hands. They're actually, you know, phrased the way they want them to. They're as accurate as they can describe them. Um, the other thing is that people don't always want to report things right away. So people sometimes want to sit on these reports and wait and decide. So let's say something escalates or uh, they're not sure if they might need documentation of what happened, but they want to get it off their chest now. They want to have it and, and then maybe never use it. Now, in some ways, that's the best case scenario is if this situation resolves itself and it doesn't even need to involve HR because let's say the person has apologized. But let's say the person's a manager. Now, what this allows is that the individual now has a timestamped record of what happened, and they can either go through the system which goes directly to HR, does not go to their manager, unless for some reason their manager is on HR, on the HR team, um, but it would go directly to the HR individual who receives spot reports. Um, now, that individual can then decide to be anonymous or not, depending on how safe they feel with that, or if for whatever reason they wanted to go to someone completely different, um, they could also potentially request, so start anonymously, request to have a particular individual involved and maybe negotiate it that way. So certainly you could get around managers and supervisors, um, especially if those supervisors are not also the core person in HR. Does that make sense? Perfect, perfect. I think we're set. Did you want to add anything to that, Jessica, before we wrap up? Perfect. No. Super. Well, I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we've um, gone, we went through a lot of information today. So I really want to make it clear that if you've got questions, if you want to see the product in more detail or in detail at all, feel free to send a note to us via our Q&A chat box and we'll reach out to you directly. Um, I want to also thank our presenters today, both Jessica and Julia. Hey. <laughs> For joining us today it was a fantastic presentation and thank you all in the audience for asking questions as well as it always makes it more inspiring to hear your thoughts on spot and harassment and discrimination so with that i'll close it out and um again be in touch if you'd like and we'll take it from there thanks everybody thank you thank you bye